tell me. Oh my goodness. Okay. I thought I had started this chapter already. Okay, so this morning um, we are doing chapter 11 from Mountains of Spices, the title of which is Umbrage and Resentment. Now, honestly, I sort of knew what the word umbrage meant, but I went to the dictionary this morning and looked it up and was very convicted by the definition that I found. It is a noun meaning offense or annoyance. Synonyms are to take offense, take exception, be aggrieved, be affronted, be annoyed, be angry, be indignant, be put out, be insulted, be hurt, be piqued, be resentful, be disgruntled, go into a huff, be miffed, have one's nose put out a joint, chafe and used in a sentence, it would sound like, I would take umbrage at that if I thought you were serious. So, yes, this was a very convicting um, word for me this morning. And so, the title of this chapter is Umbrage and Resentment. Here we go. Mercy, the daughter of Mrs. Valiant, had been talking with the shepherd. And as a result, she went to visit a friend of hers whom she had not seen for a long time. Because whenever she rang the bell of her friend's house, the servants told her that their mistress was not at home. The name of this friend was Umbridge. Umbridge had always been a bright, attractive girl admired and liked by everyone who did not know her very intimately. Her family were all in the service of the shepherd, and Umbridge herself had entered his service also as soon as she left school. When the people of the village of Much Trembling were all agog with excitement over the departure of Much Afraid for the High Places, and the efforts of her relatives to force her to return, Umbridge had thought seriously of asking the shepherd to take her to the mountains also. Mercy, who had been her school friend and good Mrs. Valiant, had both been there, she knew, and she envied them their new names. And the beauty and joy which characterized all their service. And now there was poor, ugly, much afraid actually gone off on the journey to the high places also. Umbridge really envied her, and the longing in her heart had grown very strong to make the same journey herself. But one thing held her back. Umbridge was not only extremely capable and efficient in everything which she undertook, but she had the gift of beauty also and had been accustomed to a good deal of admiration and homage from the young shepherds in much trembling, and also from some who were not in the shepherd's service at all. She herself, however, had given her heart to the tallest and strongest and handsomest of the shepherds named Steadfast, one whom the shepherd loved and trusted in a very special way. He had been a close friend and neighbor of her family, and the two had been to school together. Ever since she had realized her own gifts of beauty and attractiveness, Umbridge had never doubted that she would gain her heart's desire and become his wife. For a time, indeed, the close friendship between the two had been very noticeable. But for some reason, Steadfast had gradually withdrawn a little. And though he remained a friend and constant visitor at the house, he showed no further desire to become her lover. Umbridge had begun to brood 
first impatiently and then fearfully on the reasons for this unexpected change in his manner toward her. But the real reason was the last one in the world which she was willing to accept. Namely, that as she grew and developed, it had become very obvious that her name exactly described her nature. She was sweet and gracious and altogether delightful when she was pleased at getting what she wanted. And she expanded like a flower in the warm sunshine of admiration. But when her wishes were thwarted and she was denied her full meed of admiration, she became moody, exacting, ungracious, and disagreeable so that everyone around her was made miserable and uncomfortable. Steadfast, in a kind, brotherly fashion, had often tried to make her conscious of this unlovely fault and to tease and laugh her out of it. But even from him, he had not been able to accept the truth. She had not been able to accept the truth. And whenever he made the attempt to help her in this way, she treated him to such moods of ungracious and sullen silence that at last he gave up the attempt to help her to overcome the fault and with it all thought of making her his wife. Umbridge, having refused to face up to the fact that her own special besetting sin was the reason why her heart's desire never came to pass, went on waiting and hoping unwilling to leave for the high places as long as the matter remained unsettled. Suddenly, one day, like a bolt from the blue, came the terrible shock of finding that Steadfast had passed her by completely and had become engaged to her own younger sister, Gentleness, who was much less gifted and beautiful than herself, but was blessed with a sweetness and unselfishness of temper which poor Umbridge completely lacked. The shock had been terrible, though all her pride had risen up to hide the wound in her heart. Instead of facing the truth at last, however, that she herself was the cause of this heartbreaking anticlimax, she chose to blame steadfast and to allow the most bitter jealousy of her sister to take possession of her. Thus, blaming them and brooding on what she chose to consider the cruel wrong they had done her and longing for something to act as balm to her wounded pride, poor Umbridge found herself terribly open to temptation and began to accept the attentions of an old admirer of hers, resentment the wealthy young manager of the branch bank in much trembling. It was balm to her wounded pride that though her sister's lover was one of the most outstanding of the shepherds in the valley, resentment was, from a worldly standpoint, his superior in every way, in looks, in wealth, and in social position. That he was also hot-tempered Passionate and stubborn, Umbridge, who had known him well since they were children, was also in no doubt. But she chose to tell herself that now he was a man. He knew how to discipline his temper and that his love for her was so great that she at least would never suffer from it. To the sorrow and distress of her family, and the concern of all her friends and fellow workers, Umbridge announced her engagement to resentment. Well known though he was to be one of the chief shepherd's enemies, and shortly afterwards they were married. Since then, her former friends and companions had scarcely seen her. She had assured them that her marriage would make no difference to her fellowship with them, and that she would continue as much of her former work for the shepherd as possible, for she greatly hoped that she would be able to change her husband's attitude and be the means of bringing him, to, him too, to desire friendship with the shepherd. 
As everyone had foreseen, however, once married, her husband's implacable resentment against the shepherd, greatly augmented as it was by his unsuccessful attempts to thwart much afraid on her journey to the high places, had made this impossible. All too soon, poor Umbridge, with her sincere devotion to the shepherd, her stifled longings for the high places, and her wounded heart and pride had found herself obliged to sever all connection with her old friends and fellow workers. It is true that at first she had been almost thankful to do so, to escape what her conscience told her must be their secret condemnation of her decision to marry an enemy of the chief shepherd, and also to escape from the sight of the almost perfect happiness of her sister and steadfast. All these things had seemed so unbearable, and the satisfaction and pleasure in her new position as mistress of one of the biggest houses in much trembling, so attractive, that it seemed fairly and simple and easy thing to acquiesce in her husband's wish that she should break with all her former contacts and begin her life in a completely new circle of friends and acquaintances. Umbridge soon discovered that this was not so easy after all. She had always lived in a home where the shepherd's presence and love were predominant influences. And though she herself had so often been selfish and ungracious, the others had always reacted with love and forgiveness. Now, however, she found herself in an environment where grace and true love and forgiveness were unknown. Moreover, she quickly discovered that she was not the mistress of her husband's home at all. Far from it, his widowed mother, old Mrs. Sullen, lived with them, and her influence over her son was undiminished. She ruled the household, and very quickly, the relationship between selfish, self-willed Mrs. Sullen and her strong-willed and spoiled daughter-in-law was of the unhappiest kind. For days, the old lady would not speak to her daughter-in-law at all, but kept to her own room where, however, her son visited her and spent long hours listening to her complaints against Umbridge. It must be confessed, too, that in his wife's company, resentment had to listen to almost equally bitter complaints against his mother. So that, between the two of them, there were times when he felt he had been much better off as a bachelor, and that marriage was far from being an idyllic state. Umbridge was all too soon of the same opinion. Secretly, in the depths of her heart, she had known perfectly well that she was making a mistake. Never would she forget the day when the shepherd himself had told her so. Looking at her with his earnest, challenging, and yet compassionate eyes, he had told her just why she was doing it. Because she insisted on evading the truth about herself instead of facing up to the actual facts. He had put before her the choice either of breaking the engagement with resentment and going to the high places with himself or of going through with the marriage only to find her fellowship with him broken and herself left completely unchanged. Umbridge had fallen at his feet and said that she must, she simply must marry resentment, that she could not live without love, that she had been so wronged and wounded that nothing else could satisfy her, that she was altogether too weak and wounded now to think of the high places that what she must have was love and sympathy and kindness and protection in a home of her own where she could forget the cruel treatment which she had endured, but that she would always be his follower, always. From that day, Umbridge had not seen the shepherd personally again and had not heard his voice. She had occasionally seen him far, afar off, 
passing along the street, leading his flock or talking to one or another of the shepherds. But from the day she married resentment, knowing that she could never invite the chief shepherd into her home, from that day she had had no personal contact with him at all. And poor Umbridge had experienced the gloomy agony of those who have known him and now know him no more. For souls that once have looked upon their Lord must die or look again. One day when her husband was away as usual at the bank and old Mrs. Sullen, in one of her difficult moods, was shut up in her own room, Umbridge, dreary and miserable and almost in despair, took her little three-year-old daughter into a secluded part of the garden to escape from the curious eyes of the servants who she knew, who she, who she well knew spied upon her continually at the old lady's orders and repeated to her all her doings. The little girl was her only comfort, a sweet little thing whom the old grandmother was always trying to coax up to her own room and to spoil. Little retaliation for resentment had insisted on giving his mother's maiden name to his daughter, though her pet name was Tit for Tat, had already begun to understand that if her mother forbade anything, she had but to toddle off to grandmother to get what she wanted, along with a commiserating kiss and a candy. Her granny knew what little girls liked, even if mama did not and Umbridge had come to realize with a cold sickening of her heart that her mother-in-law was not only her implacable rival in her husband's affections, but that she was using every possible means to come between her and her child too. This terrible realization had brought her to the point of utter despair. While she was sitting there alone in the garden, weeping her heart out, she heard the iron gate open. Peering anxiously through the laurels to see whether some caller had arrived and feeling that any visitor would be an impossible agony at such a time, she caught sight of her one-time friend, Mercy, the shepherdess. She knew well that on the orders of her husband, and mother-in-law, the servants always turned away any of her old acquaintances who worked for the shepherd. Now, the sight of Mercy's beautiful, gentle, and peaceful face brought back to mind all that she had willfully thrown away and lost. Her happiness, her lovely work, her friends, and her home and there broke over her heart an agonizing flood of sorrow. She longed for fellowship again, for the touch of one really loving hand, for the sound of one really friendly voice, and most of all to see and to speak with someone who knew the shepherd. The longing was irresistible. If Mercy went to the door, she would be turned away with the polite assurance that the mistress was not at home. She must not be allowed to go to the door. So Umbridge called through the sheltering hedge in a low, imploring voice. Oh, mercy, mercy, is that really you? Come to me here. Mercy heard the trembling voice and answered at once. Dear Umbridge, are you really there? Oh, how happy I am to find you at last. And she came round the laurel hedge and turned toward her friend such a kind and loving look that Umbridge rose and throwing her arms around Mercy, laid her head on her shoulder and burst into heartbroken sobs. Thus they stood for a little while, their arms about each other without speaking while little tit-for-tat gazed up wonderingly into the face of the newcomer. At last, compelled by her sorrow and heartache, poor Umbridge unburdened herself, pouring out the whole tragic story of her unhappy marriage 
into the ears of her sympathetic friend. I can't bear it any longer, she sobbed passionately at the end. I must leave this home. I can't live with resentment and sullen any longer. I can't. I can't. But, oh, mercy, if I leave him, they will claim the child. If I am the one who chooses to leave this home, they will have the right to keep little tit-for-tat, and if I lose her, I cannot live. God have mercy on me. What am I to do? Sometimes I feel the only solution is to end life altogether. Mercy, her loving arms around her unbroken, heartbroken friend, whispered gently, Umbridge, you are forgetting. There is a solution, quite a different one to your problem. You know what the solution is. You must tell the shepherd what you have told me and ask him what you are to do. And then, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. The shepherd! wailed Umbridge in a desolate voice. The shepherd will never speak to me again. I have turned my back upon him and have disobeyed his voice. He will not help me now. Mercy, for he warned me what would happen. And I hardened my heart and would not listen. And I have done despite to the spirit of grace. And I have drawn back and he will say that it is impossible to do anything for me, for I've brought everything upon myself by my disobedience. Oh, if only I had listened to him, if only I could go back to the time before I sinned. He will say nothing of the sort, cried Mercy earnestly. You know, you must know, that you are saying what is not true about him. Why, he has only waited with the utmost love and patience until the time you should come when you, the time should come when you would be ready at last to listen to him and to seek his help. Then what is the meaning of that terrible passage in the scriptures, asked Umbridge despairingly, which says, of how much sorer punishment Shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? If we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift if they shall fall away, renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify unto themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Dear Umbridge, said Mercy earnestly, do you not see that those verses do not and cannot apply to you? For you are repentant. You do not need me or anyone else to try to persuade or force you to repent. The sure evidence that one has done despite to the spirit of grace is that he has lost all power to desire repentance and restoration. Indeed, he wants to go on crucifying the Son of God afresh and to reject the Holy Spirit. But you... You are longing beyond all words to be restored and to be in communion with the Savior again. And you can find no rest or peace until you are. That is a sure sign that his spirit is even now working in you and beginning to restore you. But, said Umbridge, still in a tone of utter despair, what about that verse which says that Esau, when he wanted to repent, could not do so? You know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. You see, it was too late for him to be forgiven, even when he wanted to repent. 
It doesn't say anything of the sort, answered Mercy cheerfully and firmly. You've got it all wrong, Umbridge. It does say that Esau sold his birthright for one morsel of meat. And then afterwards, when he was sorry he, that he had done so, he would have liked to inherit the firstborn son's blessing after all. It belonged to Jacob. And though he repented with tears that he had despised the birthright blessing of the elder son, it was too late for him to get it back. But that is quite a different thing from saying that though you are now sorry you disobeyed, the shepherd will not forgive you. Do you not see, dear Umbridge, the real meaning of the verse? Like Esau, you did despise the shepherd's offer to take you to the high places because you did prefer and choose to marry resentment. And that you cannot alter. What is done cannot be undone. Even though I find you weeping your heart out here in the garden and repenting of the wrong choice which you made in bitterness and despair. You are married to resentment and you are the daughter-in-law of poor old Mrs. Sullen and there is no getting away from that fact. However much you now regret it. In that sense, what is done cannot be undone, in spite of your repentance. But that is not to say that the shepherd no longer loves and owns you, that you need him more than ever oh, owns you, and that he will refuse to help you. It means that you need him more than ever before in these terribly difficult and tragic circumstances into which you've got yourself. Oh, my dear Umbridge, will you not realize this at last and lose not a moment longer in seeking the help, his help? For you know quite well that he can change everything completely and bring victory out of defeat, which is the one thing he loves to do most of all. Oh, Oh, if only it were so, sobbed Umbridge, clasping her hands. If only I could go to him and tell him how sorry I am and implore his forgiveness and help. Nothing would be too awful to endure if only I could be back in fellowship with the shepherd again. I am here, said a strong but gentle voice close behind her. And as the two women looked up joyfully, there was the shepherd himself. Umbridge threw herself at his feet in mercy, lifting her kind, loving eyes to his, smiled at him, and slipped away. The shepherd laid both his hands on the bowed head of poor Umbridge, and telling her that he forgave her, he blessed her. Then he lifted her up and sat talking with her for a long time. Umbridge poured out to him in passionate relief the whole sad story and said at the end, It was just as you said, my lord. I refused to be shown the truth and I have brought myself into this impossible situation. My mother-in-law hates me. My husband no longer loves me. And they are both determined to get my child away from me. She sobbed again heartbrokenly and then exclaimed, I can't stay with him any longer. I do not love him. I never loved him. And he forbids me to have any intercourse with you and with your friends. I'm just a miserable prisoner here. And if I try to go free, I must lose my child. His child and yours too, corrected the shepherd gently. She sobbed again and said nothing. Mercy was quite right, continued the shepherd slowly and clearly. She told you that there is no way of undoing this thing which you chose to do of your own free will. You are married, and though you repent of it with tears, there is no way of undoing what has been done. She cried out in anguish. 
And what am I to do? Is there no hope of escape? Must I stay here, the miserable slave of resentment and sullen until I die? By no means, said the shepherd strongly and cheerily. You can alter the fact of your marriage. You cannot alter the fact of your marriage or escape from it. But you can be more than a conqueror in it. And you can change defeat into victory. Be more than a conqueror while married to resentment, gasped Umbridge incredulously. My lord, what do you mean? Yes, certainly, said he. Do you remember, Umbridge, that when I spoke to you last, I invited you to go with me to the high places? Yes said she, gazing at him in bewilderment. Well, I ask you again now, said he, smiling upon her most beautifully. Will you start with me to the high places now, Umbridge? But, she gasped she, you just told me that I may not leave my husband even though I detest him. Nothing can help you in this situation, answered the shepherd gently and gravely, until you learn to love your husband and your mother-in-law, and that you and that you can only learn by going to the high places of love. But you must learn to love them truly and to give yourself to them completely without any reserves, asking nothing from them in return. Ambridge burst into tears again. But I can't, she sobbed miserably. One can't force oneself to love, my lord. I don't feel love for them. I feel hate. Yes, I actu actual hate. All the time I have the most dreadful feelings toward them of resentment and hate. And I can't change those feelings. They are too strong. We are not talking about you forcing yourself to love your husband, answered the shepherd gently. I know that you do not love either of them, neither him nor your mother-in-law. I know that you feel hate toward me, them, but we are now speaking of your love to me. Are you willing to be my disciple again, Umbridge? Oh, yes, she exclaimed. I long for it with all my heart. Then as my disciple, there is, of course, no question of your hating anyone. You will love them as I love them. It is true that you do hate them now. But if you will let me take you to the high places and plant the seed of love in your heart, you will find not only that it is possible that that it is possible for you gladly and truly to love your husband and mother-in-law but you will also be able to help them both in a wonderful way through your love for them how can that be possible whispered she how can i go to the high places and still stay here a prisoner in this house he smiled. There is a shortcut. There is a shortcut, Umbridge, from this house where you live with sorrow and pain to the high places of love. I frankly confess that it is a harder way than the one by which I would have taken you if you had followed me when I first asked you to do so. But nevertheless, it is a possible and real way let me tell you the secret, dear Umbridge. If you will accept the fact, honestly and sincerely, that it was your own fault that Steadfast did not find himself able to love you, but preferred your sister. If you will recognize the fact that he is blameless in this matter, and your sister too, and if, 
you will begin to accept with joy and humility the right of both of them to love each other and to be completely happy together. Even though you yourself are left in such utterly different circumstances, then, Umbridge, you will be halfway to the high places. For here in this home and in your heart, you will find growing the heavenly flower of acceptance with joy of all that is allowed to happen to you. This is a hard saying, said Umbridge in a low voice. And the second is still harder, said he gently. Hard, but not impossible. If you will bear forgivingly all the antagonism of your husband and mother-in-law, bear it and use it as a means out of which to achieve victory over your own self, bearing all without allowing yourself to feel either resentment or self-pity. Do you know what will happen then, Umbridge? What? she asked. You will find yourself up on the high places with the flower of love blooming in your heart, able to love and to rejoice in loving those two whom you now hate, and best of all, with power to help them too. For sooner or later, love changes everything. Yes, you will find that you have reached the high places without ever having left your home. For love comes into the heart not by trying to force it, but by accepting people as they are and bearing all they do against you, which is forgiveness. Are you willing for this? Umbridge looked up at him though her, through her tears and whispered again, Yes, Lord, please make it possible in my experience. Just then, her little daughter, who had been playing on the lawn with her ball, ran up to the seat where her mother and the shepherd were sitting and held up her little arms for her mother to take her upon her lap. Umbridge seized her passionately and pressing the, little in a, in a, pressing the innocent little baby face against her own, said with a sob, Titty Taddy, your mother is going to begin a new life. You know, said the shepherd quietly, but with a little smile playing around his lips. You know, I really don't like that name for a little child. Wouldn't you like to call her, just between yourselves, of course, by another name, Umbridge? Yes, said Umbridge, flushing deeply. What name, my lord? Why not call her Acceptance with Joy? Even her father would not mind your calling her Joy as a pet name. And to you, she would be a little flower of acceptance with gro joy growing in your home. Yes, said Umbridge softly. That is a lovely name, and when I call her that, I shall always remember what you have told me. The shepherd, with one of his lovely smiles, then said, I don't really like your name, own name either. It is not a good name for a disciple of mine to bear. Would you not like to change that also? The woman who had lost the man she loved because she had been in character so like her own name looked at the shepherd with tears in her eyes and nodded speechlessly. Then, said he very gently, we will call you bearing with love or forgiveness. Then he took out one of the thorn-shaped seeds of love and with gentle, with gentle but firm hand planted it in her heart and went his way. When the shepherd had left her, the woman who was to go to the high places without leaving her own home went upstairs to her room bathed herself 
and put on one of her prettiest dresses. Then she went to the apartment of old Mrs. Sullen, tapped on the door and went inside. The old lady glared at her in, in a surly manner and said not a word. Mother, said forgiveness gently, I have come to tell you how sorry I am that I have been such a disagreeable and unloving daughter to you and to ask your forgiveness. I hope to be very different in the future. Fine words, fine words, snapped the old lady. I'm glad to see that at last you seem to have come to your senses and to be conscious of your abominable behavior. But it will take more than words, Umbridge. I can assure you to convince me of your sincerity. I shall see how you behave in the days to come and whether you are really willing to be a dutiful and obedient and submissive wife to my dear son. Deeds and not fine words are the sign of real penitence. Yes, mother, said forgiveness gently, and kissed the sullen old woman for the first time in many a long month. Sooner or later, the shepherd had said love, the love he had planted in her heart, would work some change in Mrs. Sullen and in her husband also. She would wait confidently, with hope and peace, for the change which was to come. A few hours later, when resentment returned to the house and went straight to his own room, avoiding his wife as his custom was now was, he heard a light tap on the door, and turning was astonished to see forgiveness standing before him. She came up to him quietly and said in a low, trembling voice, I have come to tell you how much I need your forgiveness. For I have been such a failure as a wife and have been so selfish and demanding and unloving. He looked at her for a moment in silence, noted the gentle, humble, appealing look on her face and said in a queer voice, You've been talking with the shepherd, Umbridge? She trembled all over, but answered in a low tone, yes. Her husband stood for another moment in silence. She could not read his thoughts. She could not know that in memory he was once again upon the mountains where he and his friends had followed much afraid in order to force her to return home. Once again he was among the precipices and great forests and the mist Hearing again another woman's voice calling out fearfully and pleadingly as they closed in on her with their threats and jibes. Shepherd, oh shepherd, where are you? Come and help me. Then came the great leaping bound of the deliverer who had answered her cry and delivered her from them all. Resentment looked at his wife and said suddenly, Umbridge, things have come to such a sorry pass in our life together that it is time we should do something about it. If the shepherd can help us to begin all over again, I am willing to let him do so. And that is the end of chapter 11, Umbridge and Resentment. Oh my. So, the solution for Umbridge, forgiveness and acceptance with joy. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace.